Say, it is such a blessing to be here with you all this morning. And if it is your first time with us, I want to again say welcome. Thank you for being here, especially this time of year when it's a little bit colder out the Christmas season. It can be easier to stay in bed and I'm grateful that you all are here. And, and for me personally, this is actually one of my favorite times of year. This like window from Thanksgiving through Christmas it is pretty special because you always get your Thanksgiving meal. And then on the backside of it, you basically get the same food, but for Christmas. And so you just get to double it up, which is great, which is great. And, and one of my favorite things to do at this time of year, again, especially on a morning like this, is get a nice blanket, a warm cup of something like coffee, and put a good movie on. Boy, there ain't nothing like it. You start snuggling up a little bit, get that movie going. And one of my favorites of all time is the Black Panther. I love that man. Won't you do it? Come on. And I love the Black Panther now. And one of my favorite parts in it is at the very beginning. You see, Black Panther is about this movie about this king. He's, he's about to rule this nation called Wakanda, and it's this incredible place. I was talking with my boy Jacob yesterday, actually, when I was in the barber chair, and I was like, man, I think I might go for my own Wakanda-type look. So I'm, I'm on my way there. My mom and my grandma might feel some type of way about that, but I'm on my way there. <laughs> Nevertheless, he's about to become king, right? And there's this incredible moment in the beginning of the movie where he steps out onto this platform, and there's water falling. All his people are posted around him. And then he looks up, and it's this moment of like, man, this is what I was made for. Like, I was created for a moment like this. Like, I'm about to be king and follow in the footsteps of my grandfather and my father. And as he's about to be officially proclaimed king of Wakanda, you hear some drum beats in the background. And all of a sudden, a tribe out of nowhere comes from the back, the gorilla tribe led by Umbaku. And when Umbaku comes up, he begins to challenge T'Challa for the rights to the throne. And T'Challa accepts, and they begin to get into the fight. And they're going back and forth and back and forth. And, and at a certain point, Umbaku's a big dude, and T'Challa's a little slim. And so he grabs him up, wraps him up tight, and then he starts to headbutt him over and over again. And eventually T'Challa starts to hit this point where he's about to black out. And as his eyes start to fade, he, he looks into the crowd at no one else than his mom. And as he's looking at his mom, it's this look like, you got to give me something. Like, like the fate of the kingdom is on the line. Like my name is on the line. The future of our nation is on the line. And his mom, in all her motherly wisdom, looks at him and says, T'Challa, show them who you are. Show them who you are. And at that moment, he has flashbacks of growing up that he was trained to do this. He comes back, wins the fight. Everything goes well, Wakanda is saved, and the movie continues. Although that's at the beginning of the movie, I actually think it's the most significant part, though. Because you would think in a moment like that, the mom would say, show them what you can do, because you're in the fight of your life. But she says, show them who you are. Because who we are drives what we do. Our activity is shaped by our identity. And as we think about continuing our series this morning called Behold Him, looking at who Jesus is, last week Pastor Mike covered in great detail where Jesus came from. This morning what we're going to talk about is who Jesus actually is and the significance of who he is, particularly at this time of year. And as we jump in, a few things to note. One, we're going to be a bunch of different places in Scripture today, but our core text is John 1, verses 23 through 34. So I'm going to read through this real quick, and then we're going to go a bunch of different places and close out with all about tying to how do we see the significance of the Savior. All right, so verse 23. He said, this is John the Baptist speaking, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, Jesus saw Jesus, Jesus, he's, next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, 
I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. What John lays out very, very clearly here is who Jesus is, that he is the Lamb of God. And this is a massive moment, a significant moment in human history, in the Bible, in the whole creation of the world. And I want to recognize that sitting in a heated room in Marietta, Georgia on a cloudy day probably doesn't feel that massive, right? Like you just read that passage probably doesn't carry that much oomph. So so what we want to do this morning is talk about the significance of Jesus being the Lamb of God by looking at the past, the present, and then the promise. The past, the present, and the promise. And we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and start with Adam and Eve. You see, when God spoke the earth into existence, he brought man about and he created them, put them in the garden to multiply, to rule, all of these different things. And many of you all have probably heard the story that that at a certain point, one day in the garden, Satan appeared to Adam and Eve as a serpent. And when he came to them, he said, hey, 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 if you really want to be like God, then eat the fruit of this one tree. Now, of all the rules, God gave no rules really in the garden except don't eat the fruit of this one tree. And what Satan does is he comes to them and says, if you really want to be like God, eat the fruit from this one tree. Now, now a few things to know before we keep going. The first is that as I've been reading through this text, I find it interesting that in Genesis 3, Satan comes with the approach, if you want to be like God, implying that Adam and Eve weren't. When in Genesis 1 and 2, we see God clearly lay out, let us make man in our image. They were already like God. So the lie that Satan tried to get them to believe was to forget who they already were. And that's the same attack that he does today, right? Like if you look at what he did with the life of Jesus, right after Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, he comes up from the water, God speaks from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In the very next passage of scripture, it says that Jesus goes into the wilderness and Satan comes to tempt him. And the way he starts off the temptation is if you are the son of God. What God had already put a period on, Satan tried to put a question mark on. And that's the same thing that he does for us today. Maybe for you it's, God, do you actually love me as much as I've been told that you do? Or or maybe it's, You hear the lie whispered, I'm always going to struggle with this addiction. I'm never going to get over this particular sin. Or maybe it's, if I mess up like this again, there's no way this love that I've heard about God could actually apply to me. And what I want to call out is that the same way we respond to those lies from the enemy is the exact way that Jesus did, with the truth of God's word. So so when you feel those lies come in and, and Satan coming at you with, is God's heart really towards me? You say, no, 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 fam, because Romans 8.31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And when you find yourself in a place saying, man, am I always going to be addicted to this? Will I always struggle with this sin? I'll never get over this. No, 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 because Romans 8, 37 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then if you find yourself in a place where you're like, God, if I fall again, there's no way you could actually love me. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, for I am sure of this, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. So when those lies come at you, we attack them with the truth of God's word. Because Satan has nothing new up his arsenal. He can't create. He can only manipulate. He can only manipulate what God has already said is good. So if you are a child of God in this room, know that when Satan comes at you with those lies, you have the power of God within you to say, get behind me, Satan. I'm made in the image of God. I'm a child of God, and I stand on the word of God. Yeah, that is good. It's good. And that's not how Adam and Eve responded, which is why we're where we are today. So we get back to the story. Adam and Eve didn't do none of that. They actually ate of the fruit. They found out they were naked. All the stuff that Pastor Mike has talked about at length. I won't go into detail there. But the way the story ends is that God calls out to them and says, Adam and Eve, where are you? Because he knew that they had sinned. He knew that sin had entered into the world. 
And then God comes to them, and he begins to lay out what the curse is going to be because of the sin. And, and I want to sit here for a second because I think it's easy, again, when we read over the text to read over the emotions that are there. But I want you to imagine from God's perspective what that must have felt like. Like for every other creation, he spoke over them and called them good. But for man, it says he formed us out of the dust of the earth. It says he breathed life into our nostrils. We were the most intimate creation God has made and then betrayed him. Like the pain that that must have carried. And it was out of that place of brokenness that God says, I'm still going to make a covering for you. I'm going to take the life of one of my own creation, an animal that I made, and I'm going to create clothing for you as you go out from this garden. And ultimately what that's going to foreshadow is that I'm going to one day send a Savior who will take on your sins that you would be welcomed back into my presence. That's the way our God responds to ultimate betrayal. So when the people heard that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that's a story that probably would have come into their mind. There's another story too, though. You see, fast forward hundreds of years, the people of Israel now are in slavery in Egypt. And they're caught up in bondage, they're oppressed, like just a lot of stuff is happening. And they begin to call out to God, will you, will you save us? Will you send someone to come and deliver us? And God hears their cry, and he sends a man named Moses. And when God sends Moses to the people, he says, okay, this is exactly how it's going to happen. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to do a bunch of different plagues. He's not going to let y'all go. But at a certain point, I promise you all will leave free, and you will actually leave with the plunder of the Egyptians. But it's going to take a minute. So Moses comes, the plagues begin to roll, and it's crazy stuff, like flies, locusts, water turning into blood, like nonsense stuff that a normal person would be like, bro, y'all can just go. But for some reason, the Egyptians didn't respond that way. So they held on to the people, held on to the people. And then at a certain point, God comes to Moses and he says, this is going to be the last plague. This is the one where Pharaoh's going to let you all go. I'm going to go across the nation of Egypt, and I'm going to take the life of every firstborn, both man and beast. For my people, though, I'm going to create a way out. You see, death has to be paid for the sin that's been brought out. But I'm going to create a covering for you again. I want each family to take a lamb and slaughter it. And then the blood from that lamb, I want you to paint it on your doorpost. And that will be a sign as I come through that you belong to me, that you're mine. And that night, the Spirit of God came through. The Israelites were sent away ultimately into freedom. Now that's all the context that would have come with John saying, this is the Lamb of God. Like the people should have been hyped. Like from Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament up to this point, it had been about 400 years since God had spoken. So like Jesus being the Lamb of God, like this is a massive moment. And the people didn't respond like that though. Like it'd be like if a big party was happening and we just missed it. And, and I want to double-click into a specific verse as to why I think that is. If you go back to verse 29, it says, Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Who takes away the sin of the world. What's promised there is an immediate spiritual freedom. What's not promised is an immediate physical freedom. And for the people in Israel, right, like the context would have been very, very similar to when they were in Egypt. You see, just as they were oppressed then, they were oppressed now by the Roman rulers. And just as they had been calling out to God then, they had been waiting for this Messiah to come back and deliver them. And so Jesus coming should have been met with a ton of hype, and it wasn't because the big difference is that while in Egypt the lambs from God led to immediate physical freedom, when Jesus comes, the Lamb of God leads to immediate spiritual freedom. And, and while, it's, while it's so, it is good and easy to amen, I think if we're honest, we can relate to that struggle, though. That, that tension that exists when it's like, God, my, my spiritual reality isn't matching my physical reality. I, I was with a few friends earlier this week, and we were processing the question, what's some of the stuff that God's taught us over this past year? 
And, and as we began to work through some of the scenarios we've experienced, it was things like miscarriages, cancer scares, strokes, family wounds, just a variety of stuff that's just like, God, why won't you change the physical circumstance to match my spiritual one? Like, if you care that much, why won't you change that? And maybe for you, especially around this time of year, is that your Christmas table doesn't look exactly how you want it to look. Like, maybe someone's not there who you wish was there. Or maybe someone's there you wish wasn't. Either way. (laughs) Maybe it's that the gifts under the tree aren't exactly what you wish you could provide for your children. Maybe there's not a tree at all. Maybe you were hoping finances would look a lot different coming into this time of the year, and it's just not going to be enough. God, why won't you change my physical realities to match my spiritual one? And image family, to be honest, I don't know. It would be so much easier to stand up here, get a little bit hype, and say, you know, if you just pray right, give right, and do right, God's going to turn this thing around by Christmas. You're going to walk in prosperity. And the reality is, I would be absolutely lying. Now, he could do that and may do that, but if I were to tell you that, we would all leave here kind of like a balloon puffed up with hot air, but the second we get hit with the reality from the world, we would bust. Our desire at this church, every time someone preaches the word, is that we would never leave here puffed up but filled up with the word of God. So when the challenges of life come, we are built on the rock that will not fade, no matter the storms, no matter the wind, no matter the pressure. So, Mitch family, that's what we're going to look at this morning. In the midst of that delta of physical circumstances and spiritual circumstances not matching up, what promises can we actually hold on to? And that takes us to our next section of promise. So we're going to flip to Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. And and just a disclaimer, I don't read this book near enough. Partly, I don't understand all of it. That's what I need Jonathan for. Nonetheless, we're going to walk through Revelation today. And there is one particular passage of Revelation that I think just, it's just a promise that we can just hold on to. And what I want us to do this morning is actually read it out loud together Because in Revelations 1, 3, it says, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy out loud. So I want us to actually read this out loud together as a promise that we can hold on to in the midst of our current realities. So I'm going to count to three. I'm I'm actually going to say three, and then we'll read, because, you know, sometimes that'd be confusing. Like, is it one, two, and then read, or one, two, three? So it'll be one, two, three, then we read. All right, all right. Y'all ready? Okay. One, two, three. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Yeah, that's the promise we get to hold on to. In the midst of the delta of our physical and our spiritual, we get to hold on to the truth that one day we serve a God who not only sees our tears, he bottles them up. And he will make all things new, that the pain we're currently experiencing will be no more. The financial pain and struggle, you're like, where is the next thing going to come from? God's going to provide an abundance when he returns to make all things new. In this church, that's what we can hold on to. Yeah. And it's good news. It's good news. But as the movies often say, but wait, there's more. Because there's not just a promise for what's to come. There's a promise we get to experience right now. And that goes back to John 1. We're going to look at verse 33, and where John says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, 
He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. The promise we have right now, church family, is God's presence on the inside of us. That Jesus has given us of his Spirit. Romans 8, 11 would say the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of each and every one of you who call on his son. We get God's presence right now. I was talking with one of my best friends just uh, probably a few months ago, and he called me around 9 o'clock at night, and I could just hear the pain in his voice. And he's just like, Fred, I'm, man, I'm at the end. Like, I actually don't know how we're going to get through this in our marriage. And I remember us going back and forth and back and forth and talking and processing it. And it got to a place where we were just like, man, we just got to go before the Lord. And we, got, we were on the phone and we started to pray together. And I specifically remember just, just believing that God would move. And asked him specifically that God would speak to him that night in his dream. That God would give him something to hold on to. So we went to bed. Next morning we got up. And I called him on my way to work. And it was one of those moments where it was just like, God, I, I know that you've moved. Like, I just know you moved. And I got on the phone with him. And he began to tell me about this dream that he had. And, and most of it, like, wasn't really applicable. But towards the end he was like, Fred, the two words God gave me were be patient. Be patient. Here's the thing, though. As he and I have processed that scenario again and again, it really wasn't about the words be patient. God could have said honestly anything. Be kind, be long-suffering, whatever it was. What he and I are struck by is that two of God's children at 9.45 at night could call on his name and he would come down and move in the situation. Image family, that's what we have access to in the presence of God. And that's really what this whole time has been about, is tying back to that moment. Because think about it, when Adam and Eve were created in the garden, they got to experience the presence of God. When God brought Israel from captivity, he said, I'm bringing you out to worship me and to be in and experience my presence. Jesus coming down brought the presence of God with him to change all of our realities. And the ultimate promise of Revelation 21 is verse 3 where it says God's bringing his kingdom down. Like his kingdom is coming down to be among man. That we would get to be in and experience his presence again. One of God's desires has always been that his people would be in and experience his presence. And so Image Family right now, I don't know what the delta is for you in your physical reality and your spiritual reality, but I know that there is a promise you can hold on to for one day, and there is a promise you have access to today, and that is the Spirit of God on the inside of you because we have seen the significance of the Savior. So what do we do with all this tomorrow? Right, like it's cool to hear this on a Sunday morning. What do we do with this tomorrow, though? Well, I think if we go back and look at John, he gives us a pretty good example of how you respond. If you're a Christian, if you've seen the significance of the Savior. You see, John, we didn't talk about a lot this morning, but his story is one that a countless number of sermons could be written on. And what John did was two specific things. He represented the Savior, and he revealed the Savior. He represented by living in such a countercultural way that people were just drawn out to see, what in the world are you talking about? Who in the world are you? And then when those people came out, he revealed the Savior by saying, this is the Lamb of God. He represented and he revealed. And if you're a believer here this morning, that is the same response, that you would represent the Savior. And what does that look like? If you think about the fruits of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit brings about in us, are you characterized as a person of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc.? Because the reality is that a lot of what you do day to day might look similar from even an occupational standpoint to the rest of the world. 
But how we do it, that should look a lot different. We should be characterized by those fruits of the Spirit. And then when someone asks you for the reason you are so different, do you reveal the Lamb? And if you don't know where to start with that, here's where I would love to start. What about Jesus do you love the most? Is it that he's your best friend? That he's your comforter? That he's your provider? That he knows you and sees you and loves you fully? That he is the Savior who gave you access to new life? Start there and then move out. That's the response for us as believers today. And if we're not a believer in this room, the invitation is to see the significance of the Savior. Because for believer or not, ultimately it's the same call of action to all of us, that we would see Jesus for who he is and respond accordingly. This morning, as I was finishing up preparing for today, I had this picture on my mind of what the morning was going to look like. Wake up early, get a nice cup of coffee, spend some time in prayer, journaling, you know, just doing the whole spiritual thing. And and about 6.30, I heard Charlie, our three-year-old, Dada, I'm awake. And it was like, all right, best laid plans, that's shifting. (laughs) And man, I'd love to tell y'all that up here right now preaching, I responded with just joy and love and grace. And boy, I was hot. (laughs) Like, Charlie, you don't understand. I'm trying to help people love God. I don't have time to love you message. (laughs) But nonetheless, I get her out of her crib. I change her pull up. And man, I'm so frustrated. Like I'm just hot. And Charlie's just looking at me just as innocent as she can be. And I'm just like, you messed up my mom. And I take her downstairs and I'm like, Charlie, what do you want to do? She's like, dad, I like some cereal. Just as innocent as she can be. So I'm like, all right, I'll get you some cereal. Pour it, give it to her. I'm still pouting. And one of which one of us is three. I'm still pouting. (laughs) And then I go and I start making my oatmeal and I like making heat it up and all that. And I sit down next to her. And as I bow my head to pray, she puts her arm on my shoulder and she says, Dad, I love you. And I was like, man, what kind of guy am I? Like, <laughs> but what was funny is like when I heard her say that, and already my heart had kind of been shifting. Like I went from like, man, I really don't want to be with you right now to hearing that like, man, I love being with you. And as I think about the significance of the Savior this morning, that's the heart of our Father towards us, that he just wants to be with us. And far better of a dad than me who needed his heart to get some work done to get to that point, God looks at you and says, I want you. I want you so much that I'll send my own son to come and pay the price for your life that you could be welcomed back into my presence. I want you. Image Church, that is the invitation for us this morning, to see the significance of a God who would do that. That in the midst of this holiday time, with the gifts, the family, the food, that we wouldn't miss a Savior who offers us the gift of eternal life with him. That we wouldn't miss the Savior who offers us a family that is deeper than blood. And that we wouldn't miss a Savior who offers us more than just food on this earth, but an eternal banquet. We will get to be with him and celebrate the risen king. Mm. Mm. Image Church, everything we look forward to about Christmas in just another week is simply a foreshadow to what Jesus is promising. And just as we started our time together this morning with that story from T'Challa, Show them who you are. Jesus has shown us who he is. Will we believe him? Father, God, you are good. God, you love us and you are for us. Would you help us to see the significance of Jesus? to see the significance of your son who came into the world to bring redemption, restoration, and new life. God, will we trust you? In this Christmas season, would we see you? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.